What do you think of when you think of black metal? Is it a sound, a musical format, or is it an attitude, a way of life, a scene, a movement, or a deeply personal expression from musicians on what really are the outer fringes of what society considers normal? Well, today we're going to ask someone who knows more about black metal than most. He's certainly travelled within the scene. He's met the people. He's, he's, he's just been part, really, of the music. And he knows anyone who's anyone when it comes to making it. He's Dial Patterson, a zine writer turned journalist for Terrorizer some years ago, Metal Hammer and more, and lately the author of a series of fine books documenting the rise and continued evolution of the genre. Now, I first met Dial when we wrote together uh, for Terrorizer what seems like an eternity ago now. Uh, he struck me then, as he does now, as an enormously thoughtful and dedicated journalist who really strives to win the trust of the artists he interviews. And they do trust him uh, in, in a way that they don't trust other people. We can see that from the access that he has gained. And also, Dial really isn't interested in the day-to-day uh, stuff of releases and promotion and all that. And it means that his books really have become now quite seminal, or they're on their way to becoming quite seminal books. Uh, They are The Prelude to the Cult, The Cult Never Dies, Into the Abyss, and The Evolution of the Cult, all documenting black metal's development and and, and what its makers really think about it. Uh, They're becoming the last word, really, on the genre in a way that's quite different uh, to the last most important book, and that will, of course, be your dog-eared copy uh, of Lords of Chaos uh, by Michael Moynihan. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk to Dial now about his thoughts on the recent folding as well of Metal Hammer magazine, though I must say, uh, strangely, in the days since we had this chat, uh, we've been overtaken by events a little, and the mag has of course now been rescued, uh, which is a good thing, as you'll hear him uh, mull on. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. So, I'm Earl Grey, you're listening to the Metal Insight Podcast, episode 31, produced and reported by MetalIreland.com. Now let's talk to Dial. I was really waiting for many years for somebody to write a black metal book uh, that would sort of bring together all the strands of this very, very disparate movement and kind of uh, explain the history, but, but in a sort of um, honest way and without an agenda um, and what I kept seeing was that people were writing or making films or, you know writing articles all the people that were involved with that tended to be from outside of the industry or outside of the scene the music the background it was it was something that was exotic for them um, and because of that they tended to ask the same questions uh, because they didn't necessarily have that background to know what had already become kind of old news and what was, um, yeah, what was not worth talking about maybe. And also I think the same handful of people were being written about and talked to again and again. So it was always the mayhem story, uh, the Burzum story, you know, and there, there was so much more to black metal than that. I really wanted to kind of read a book which was, had all the voices from you know outside of norway from uh more obscure norwegian artists like thorns um and and yeah i waited for for a few years and it never it never surfaced and i think at at some point in 2009 i sort of i just said yeah i'm I'm, I'm gonna give it a go and do this myself indeed and i wonder was part of that um i mean certainly i guess you and i sort of come from a time when the lords of chaos uh, book was kind of the formative text as it were uh, on black metal but not without its problems yeah uh, i think i think lords of chaos is is an interesting book but it's it's very flawed if you're you, you know to use that as um as a way of understanding black metal as a phenomenon um yeah i mean it's more of a true it's basically a true crime book i think there's really only a is a third of it is maybe or half of it is about black metal in fact even you know if you think about where this where the name of the book comes from um it was actually named after the chapter on um some gang of 
high school kids in America who shoot their teacher and I think listen to Metallica or something. They were certainly weren't from the extreme metal scene. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting true crime book and an interesting book on other things. But I, I really wouldn't see, you know, it's, it, as far as black metal goes, it's only touching upon three years and, you know, majority of it's based on Norway. Um, so I think, you, I, I think that kind of complements actually the books I wrote or, you know, they complement each other because they're so, so wildly different. Mm. And, uh, and it wasn't just Lords of Chaos. I think, you know, a lot of the films and a lot of the articles, it, you know, the, the thing that they had in common was that they weren't written by, they weren't really written by black metal fans or black metal yeah. protagonists or, you know, practitioners. So there's always going to be that distance. And I think, I think that causes a problem and sort of distorts the whole picture, a bit, I, you know, ultimately. I know what you mean, because there was a period in time there, probably, I don't know, around quite late in the game really probably around 08 09 or something whenever uh, people like vice and and other documentarians but i suppose you could take it back to peter best's uh, awesome photography but th- there was a sort of high crest of a wave where black metal was sort of being fetishized in the, in the sort of uh, you know alt or sort of popular consciousness or whatever over and above the metal underground yeah i think that still continues to be true i mean i think if you're not from the metal scene and you want to you know dip your toe in and maybe do a you know do a documentary or, or write an article it's not surprising that black metal is is the thing that jumps out to people because it's the most visually interesting it's the, got the biggest controversies you know if somebody's come from a i don't know a what you know a dubstep background or something and they hear oh there's a scene where you know the two main bands end up killing each other and there's you know, set fire to church. You know, of course, it seems like, oh well, uh, you know, I, I should write about that and bring it to the. Well, it's the second. It's, the world. it's second only to East Coast West Coast rap, isn't it? In that regard. Yeah. And you know, and, and I think you know, people are kind of interested in hip hop, and they read these stories about hip hop. You know, they know that that's big, and everyone knows about that. But because they didn't know about black metal, I think there's a sort of assumption that nobody does. Indeed. Uh, and I think you'll probably actually see more of that now with the Lords of Chaos movie. If that's a success, I would guess that there'll be a new generation of people um, who are interested in that and discovering it and, you know, who aren't aware of it now. Or, you know. it, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. I was going to come to that a lot later, actually, but since you've, you've mentioned it, I did want to ask. I mean, it sounds like an absolute uh, butt-clenchingly, teeth-grindingly, fist-eatingly, excruciating uh, idea do you think it, it truly can be any good? Um, no, but I don't think that you and me are the are the target audience. I would guess that the target audience will be, you know, millennials, to use that awful phrase. Um, you know, I guess it's a, a film for the youth. I don't think they're really targeting people who are um, who have been into black metal for a long time. So, it, you know, it, it might be a good. Uh, I, I would like to think it could be a decent entertaining film, but it would it would offend people like you and me because we'll see all the things they got wrong and you know how how kind of crude a caricature it'll be. So I think, I, yeah, to answer your question, it would be nice if it was good. It probably won't be, um, and it's not really. They don't really care. I, I guess whether, well, whether it, we like it or not. Indeed, and that, and that of course makes no odds uh, to anyone. So let, let's let's talk about the proper stuff, which is which is of course what we want to talk to. I mean, you have now talked to so so many people uh, who were instrumental or formative uh, within the genre that you have a real insight into the characters that made it. And you know, j- just in in the guys I, I've met over the years, I was always interested in in. In, in in the differences, I suppose, between them and, and the spectrum that they all sort of exist on, um, from the sort of hell and leather, you know, your Mardocks of this world, um, through to the likes of, you know, Ishan and people like that, the deeply uh, committed and cerebral sort of people that, that get into this. T- tell me about some of the standout personalities that you have now come to encounter, because you... They respect you now. You know, you look at Facebook. You are the the documentarian of of the scene that they have aligned their lives with. Uh, they know now that you, you're the go to guy to talk to. You're the chronicler of their um, 
of their lifetime's work, really. And so, who who really stuck out for you, and for what reason? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Um, yeah, that's that's nice to hear. Um, I, I always struggle with this question because, I, without wanting to sound kind of um, trite, I, I think another thing that's allowed me to do these books without ever getting bored of, of, the, of the project is that unlike other metal genres or other genres of music it's very unusual to find a good black metal band that doesn't have an interest in personality in some respect behind it i do think that um you know obviously i i listen to a lot of death metal and doom and, and other genres and and there's obviously very interesting personalities behind that as well but i have noticed that you know I think that pe people who make black metal, they tend not to do it casually. They, 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 they tend not just to be a musical expression. Um, they, there's usually some sort of ideology or belief behind that, even though that, you know, differs wildly in terms of uh, specifics. But people tend to be motivated by wanting to say something. Um, and so I actually haven't, I can't think of, I mean, I think there's probably... 200 people so far that I've interviewed for this project and I don't think any of them would what I would describe as normal people or kind of normal citizens they all had uh, you know some kind of eccentric element to their personality which is um, which is very rewarding as, a, as an interviewer because you know that's kind of what makes makes the story um, standout people it, uh, it's really tough actually um, well, look I'll give your brain a minute I'll give your brain a minute, but what, what I would say, so so mull on that for a second, right? But what I would say is, I, I know what you mean by that, that they are not normal citizens. I mean, we think of Peter Best's photography, and we think of Bergen, and we think of, I can't remember, was it was it Tack or someone like that? Who, you know, or I can't remember who was the guy in the corpse paint outside the uh, the wooden house with, with the granny walking past. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's uh, King. From, of course it is, Gorgoroth. Yeah. So, so the, and... You know, we've been around these guys. They are they are eccentrics. They're not just sort of in it for the kicks. Um, do you think they felt understood when when you were talking to them? Do you think they got a kind of communication to you uh, that they wouldn't normally get just from their their? I don't know if they have any mates really, but <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I would hope to say yes. Um, it, it's hard to answer that question in a kind of you know modest way, but I would I would definitely. Uh, like to think that's true and I think that's something that came out in a lot of the testimony you know, I, I put on the website um, a lot of the testimonials from the bands and that was something that was kind of encouraging to see was that uh, you know for example uh, people like uh, Dolk from Campfire and um, Jürgen from uh, Bethlehem they said they done you know 25 years of interviews and, and never had that sort of experience or, or spoken or revealed as much to a journalist nice. so that's something that's really good to read because i wouldn't want to there wouldn't be any point in these books if there wasn't something completely new being revealed um, Indeed. and yeah I, i've been reading fanzines and magazines since i guess 95 so i did you know i kind of know when something hasn't been talked about or when if someone's talking about something and it's not been touched upon uh, because i've read all that stuff I tend to have a curiosity, like, oh, I didn't, you know, I've never heard this before. Let's let's find out a bit more about that. So, the whole thing's kind of driven by my curiosity as a fan, and um, I think perhaps that's why uh, the interviews tend to get new stuff from people. It's not just um, it's, it's it's not just sort of uh, quote unquote good journalism or whatever. It's it's partly because I genuinely am interested. You know, I've been listening to an album for. 20 years and I always wondered this and nobody ever asked about it so I, here's my opportunity and I'm going to do that um, and yeah I would like I would like to think that they feel that they can uh, kind of talk in a, on a level where they don't where they haven't been able to before and also I think part of it is the length because these chapters are you know each chapter of the book is dedicated to one band by and large yeah and usually maybe you know some of the chapters are 10,000 words long and you, you can't go into that level of detail in a magazine interview, just simply because there's not space. How do you feel? I mean, I don't, I don't really want to dwell on on what we talked about as being the sort of uh, true crime uh, aspect because it's a very old 
very very old and, and, and now quite passe story but how does it feel to you to be around characters that are in some cases quite deviant or uh really really qu- just have something deeply unpalatable or or wrong about their past and and i mean just an example i i, I remember i was on the street actually in um in, in oslo some years ago and just hanging around with some folk and I bumped randomly uh, into um, Faust from Emperor and and I you know shook his hand said hello and stuff like that he's a perfectly nice guy and then I just thought god you know we all know what happened there um, I'm not quite sure I'm kind of down with that you know that I'm around here uh, writing about this stuff and you know just just being in that situation but then I had to sort of force myself to think well you know certainly from the Northern Irish example uh, you know, we're surrounded by people who were uh, in, in terrorist organisations, you know, and are now uh, perfectly acceptable, you know, uh, part of the political process, for example. So, you know, one can't be too picky. And of course, people go to jail, serve their time. And, and that's the point of, of prison is that you do your time. So, uh, you know, I'm just wondering, how, how does it feel to you to be around some people who are, are, are quite deeply uh, eccentric and deviant uh, in their own ways sometimes? Um, it sounds funny, but I feel like a lot of the people that I went, you know, grew up with were, were, were a bit like that also. So I, I, I don't really, um, yeah, in my life there's always been characters like that. I mean, I, I would have not to the extent of, you know, murdering a guy in a wood, uh, but to be fair, there's not many bands in black metal who, who are as extreme, who, who, you know, who are involved in as extreme stuff as as um, Faust. No, it it is an outlier. I, I realise that that does detract from the from the um, from what we were saying there. But look, I I did say a moment ago who who were the standout personalities in your mind. So who would you sort of say really gave you some sort of deeper? You felt that there was something at their core that made them quite uh, special, or 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 even I don't know, bad or difficult. I mean, who who stood out for you? Um. I'll, I'll give you a few. Like, uh, King Diamond was someone who, had, you know, was very interesting to interview, and you know, it obviously was very thought through a lot of the things that he'd been involved in in his life and and his philosophies, and yeah, definitely was uh, you know because this is one of the oldest guys, probably the oldest guy in all the books, I guess. Um, so it would be quite expected that he might not take. Some of this stuff as seriously as he used to but it you know that was reassuring that he was he was um very polite and and thoughtful and uh intelligent guy but also still stuck to these a lot of his ideas that he'd had in the early 80s so that was that was interesting um the mayhem guys by and large are very interesting characters you know very different characters but all quite definitely all quite eccentric people it's mayhem's a really interesting example isn't it because you're right, they're so, so different. Um, and I can't help... Yeah, I, I always remember Necro Butcher as being sort of... a kind of slightly sort of unhinged and kind of gritty guy, whereas you've got Hellhammer's really quite quiet and, and, and you know, quite a gentle guy, really, uh, and sort of a bit, a bit more thought through. They're, they're very different people, aren't they? Yeah, and, you know, also, if you, if you think about the 90s... I mean, obviously, I've never interviewed... Euronymous or dead, sadly. But if you think about their mid '90s incarnation, you had um, Maniac, Necrobutcher, Blasphemer, and Hellhammer, and those are all very different people. Um, you know, and that's part of what what made that lineup um, so interesting and productive, and also why it kind of imploded in the end. But uh, yeah, strong characters. I mean, Mysticum is another one. Mysticum has always been um, one of my favorite bands. And they always had, you know, because there was so much sort of distance from them to everything else, just yeah. because they made one, you know, one album and then basically disappeared. And, you know, it was really, that's another band where it's been, very, I'm, I'm, I was glad as a fan not to have been disappointed because all three of them are extremely eccentric, interesting people and extremely different to one another. Um, so, so that was, yeah, a very, very interesting group of people. Um, uh, and, and some of the more obscure characters were interesting as well, like Leah from um, Silencer, who'd never done an interview in his life. Mm. Um, you know, that's a, another strange band with a strange history. So 
I, I think it's quite interesting when you talk to somebody who hasn't been involved in the interview process because then it, it's not really, there's nothing rehearsed. There's no kind of there's no patter. Yeah, exactly. And the same with um, I interview guys from Forgotten Woods and uh, Bethlehem, as I mentioned before. It's funny. A lot of the uh, depressive black metal bands. I think going into it, I might have assumed that a lot of the a lot of the kind of strangeness or the depressive et- you know element would be kind of uh, a mask to wear part of the image. But by and large, those were bands that had really tragic, strange histories and and you know very depressive personalities and um you know that like street uh, maybe the first depressive black metal band you know really a tragic story you know just death after death and and uh yeah very very sort of tragic tragedy really see that that, that that's that's a that that's a real insight because one sometimes thinks of the um, you know, you take a band like Shining and Kvarthorth and th- stuff like that, you just think, goodness, you know, it's all image, you know, it, it, this prima donna kind of this fetishizing of, of suicidal sort of ideation and, and cutting and stuff like this. But when you when you say there that you have, you know, talked to some of the, the more depressive, you know, the, the side of things and that they do genuinely come, this is their expression of the tragedy in their lives. I don't think a lot of people realize that. I think a lot of people might think, no, this is just a theme. This is just their outlet. But actually, you seem to be saying that it, this really does come from within. Yeah, and I was surprised. You know, I mean, I because I'm working chronologically, um, and there's there's uh, of the four books I've released, three of them are chronological. So I, you know, I'm I'm working in certain areas and then working on the next area. So, for example, the next books have Greece. But there hasn't been much grease so far. But the three areas where I really concentrated on, uh, or three of the areas that I really concentrated on so far, was Poland, uh, Norway, and depressive black metal. So I really, I, you know, I really dug deep into that and interviewed, I guess, uh, fifteen bands, like fifteen of the what I would consider the key bands. You know, Hypothermia and uh, Shining and Nocturnal Depression, Street, Silencer. Um, so yeah, I, I think going into that, I wouldn't have expected, I wouldn't have expected it to have been quite as literal and, and tragic as uh, as it turned out to be. And actually, the second book, uh, Cold Never Dies, Volume One, it, it gets quite heavy. Actually, quite a few people have written or, or written reviews or have written to me and said that the last part of the book gets a bit heavy because there's so much, uh, you know, suicides and. and drug addictions and overdoses and uh, sexual abuse and you know it, it, it is pretty heavy and, and actually to be fair to Nicholas I mean he's a very <laughs> unusual character you know I mean as much as there's an image there and a sort of um, as as much as marketing plays a part in shine and you know Nicholas is definitely not a typical typical person with a typical background you know it's, uh, it's hard to imagine what he'd be doing if he wasn't in a black metal band did you ever find yourself in a strange or, or, or sort of situation where you thought, oh, I shouldn't be here? No, I found myself in lots of, lots of strange situations over the last seven years. Um, but no, nothing like, no, not really. Um, no, I can't think of anything that uh, that worries me at that level. Mm. Uh, but yeah, as I say, like I think... I think you just, yeah, there is, you sort of get used to being around, maybe you get a bit desensitized to it, or you just sort of put yourself in a different um, a different mode when you're with certain types of people. But I've never really had a, you know, none of the bands have ever taken issue really with, with what I've been saying. Or um, There are some artists that I wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of, uh, but I never have been in that position. I, I, I've more or less got on with all the people involved, really. And that, you know, I think, again, that comes down to maybe just having a lot of shared backgrounds, even if it's just a musical thing or a cultural thing. You know, if you've both been in the scene for 20 years, it, there's so much shared territory that you can kind of find... Yeah, there's an unspoken, there's an unspoken uh, equality there, isn't there? Yeah, and, and you know, it, there's also a slightly different relationship doing these books to doing, for example, a magazine interview or a, 
you know, a, a web web scene interview or whatever, because they're not there just to promote their latest album. So they're sort of, it, it's a bit more um, collaborative because very, you know, it's, it's unusual. We just do an interview and then that's the end of the end of the connection. There's usually quite a lot of discussions before and after. Um, you know, they tend, they choose the pictures, but by and large, they're involved. They could, they can add comments if they wanted to into the interview. So I think there's more of an understanding uh, that they're part of the process, and I, that was really the aim. Because you know, with the, with all those documentaries and books we were talking about before, it, it always felt like the bands weren't really getting their voice out there, and the, you know, the things would come out, and then they'd say, "Oh, I didn't say that," or mm. that was taken out of context. So. Uh, yeah, I guess my aim was already always to kind of give the give the musicians a voice and and avoid that sort of distance between what the band meant and what the reader ends up understanding. And you, I mean, one of the most heartening things about your your quest is that you've also um, talked to people who are really, really fundamentally important to what black metal is and was, but who aren't musicians. And I'm, I'm thinking primarily of Christoph Spadjil, um, who, you know. How many hours I must have spent myself tipexing his logos faithfully onto my, you know, black denim school bag or whatever. Uh, what was what was he like? He was so important to to black metal and still is. Yeah, I mean, I've used the word eccentric a lot in this um, in this interview, but but that's a man who kind of uh, you know, if you if you if you had the right dictionary and looked under the word eccentric, you would see a picture of Christoph. He's um, yeah, a very unusual character, um, and very, I would say, actually very different to the rest of the people. As much as the as as the people in the black metal scene I've dealt with vary from each other, he varies from all of them because he's from a very sort of uh, he's quite a sort of um, I don't know an innocent an innocent guy in a way. He's he's not a, you know he's not a drinker. He doesn't doesn't use drugs. He's not um, a satanist. He's not you know he's he's not involved really in anything transgressive. He's um, he speaks seven languages. Uh, uh, very intelligent guy, but but that works in the co-op. So there's a lot of you know, and, and now he's doing logos for Rihanna and Metallica. So that's another. It's quite qu- quite amazing. I mean, I, I, one wonders how he came to interface with Black Metal. I mean, what was his first logo? Was it like I don't know? I mean, Emperor well, Emperor comes to mind, but what? Yeah, what, Emperor yeah. was one. Emperor was one of the first ones, and it was. You know, it was undoubtedly the one that made his name because they credited it, or you know, as a key album. And yeah. On, the credits were fairly minimal, and you had logo by Christoph. Um, so that was what really made him famous. He he was, uh, yeah, he was into metal from a young age. He was doing a fanzine, and he would, you know, he used to like to draw from a young age. That was his thing, and he would see logos and think, I can do better than that, and write them and. Uh, he didn't like the first Emperor logo, so he wrote to them and said, "You know, I'll make make you a better logo." And I think he was already uh, he was already in contact with Samoth from Samoth's previous band. I don't think he did the logo for that, but at least he did a review of it or something. Wow, and, good good uh, man. Yeah, and, you know, and now he's able to get some recognition, which is good because um, I actually he was one of the first people I interviewed when I used to do a fans in like mid two thousands, and he was one of the people I interviewed for that. And I've just interviewed him again for the next book. Um, and we also uh, put on an exhibition for him with the, the book launch for the last, the book before last, uh, we included, I included uh, an exhibition or, and he was one of the people that exhibited. So we did a, we did an interview, you know, a Q and A kind of thing. Excellent. And, um, and then funnily enough, it was on, it was because when he, it was coming up to do that exhibition that he met Rihanna's manager or whoever it was just on the he literally met her in the street saw that she had tattoos and said oh I design you know I design logos for rock and metal bands here's my card which is quite an odd thing to do to a complete stranger but it turned out that she was like the art director for Rihanna so (laughs) so so I take some of the blame for the uh his involvement in that wonderful wonderful um so i said at the start you know we would obviously look at where we've got to um you know we look at bands nowadays like crick's core or however you pronounce that or mcgrath or um i don't know a lot of these bands are killing article portal all these people you know they straddle various lines of the underground the deep underground and they're all uh, shrouded now. You know, we had the era of corpse paint. We had the era of no corpse paint. It's like Kiss. And now we have the era of shrouds 
across your face. I mean, I, I just wonder how you feel this is all developing. I mean, do, are you happy with the aesthetic nowadays or, or do you think we've lost something? Um, it's funny, actually, because yesterday uh, one of the guys from Blaze of Perdition who, who were interviewed in the last book uh, posted this meme on Facebook, which was like, because he's obviously he's from a Polish band and Maguire also Polish and a lot of the other bands that have this aesthetic are Polish. And he posted something like modern, it's like modern black metal starter kit and it's just a leather jacket and, you know, this hood and a uh, face cover. <laughs> yeah. That's um, kind of what I'm alluding to here. It's kind of, uh, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's it's funny because I, um, I often do merch at, at shows in London with um, Alex from Macabre Omen. And, and this is sort of a recurring thing that we took you know the older you get the, more, the quicker you see these sort of uh i don't want to use the word trend because it's um it's quite a loaded word in metal culture but you know you see these waves getting quicker and quicker and, and you know um things coming back and you know now yeah we, we i think maybe we're coming out of the back out of it now but we're sort of in the uh and we were talking about this funny enough on the phone yesterday actually that, that, that there's a sort of um there was this wave of like everything was a cult, you know. There was a cult rock and a cult metal. Yeah, kind of yeah. Metal. Well, everyone was in robes and with incense there for for yeah. uh, for six months. Yeah, I mean, every everyone used incense. Everyone knew um, their pseudonym would be their just the first letter of their name. I tell you what, I, I kind of liked the incense because it's better than the smell of the jacks in <laughs> in most metal venues. I think everyone would agree. Yeah, I think uh, I think Watain we're probably responsible for a lot of these things. Yeah. But, but the thing is, there's now like a whole um, generation of fans and musicians who grew up with that and think you kind of need to do that. Like mm. every gig has to be called a ritual. Yeah. You have to cover your face. You know, for them, you know, if you were born in, let's say, I don't know, mid nineties, then that's what you've grown up with. So like the corpse paint and all that probably seems kind of, older or i don't know less less relevant so yeah i don't have a problem with it it, it is funny how it, yeah i don't have a problem with it but it is funny how in especially in extreme metal and underground metal which is always talking about being anti-trend you do see the same patterns you know repeating and, yeah. and sort of people stick into these very strict uh things that were once innovative for one or two bands becomes like a uniform. But I think that's inevitable. I mean, you could probably say the same of Corpse Bane. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, I want, because you have been uh, seen and heard so much of all this, what to you is the, the pinnacle moment of black metal in its record form? And what is the pinnacle moment of, that you ever saw it live? I have a, a couple of ideas of my own, but what, what, what to you were the, 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 the pinnacles of the genre? live and and on record mm. um again that's a question i guess sort of harder with every year that passes because there's so much stuff that uh that i didn't necessarily give enough attention to in the 80s or 90s when i wasn't been listening to metal in the 80s really but you know as you go back and so much of what i'm doing is kind of going back and digging into things you hear a demo that you just you know you couldn't believe you missed first time around or even a fairly big album um i guess a few uh, it's difficult. I mean, Dean Mysterious is obviously a, a milestone. Mm. And, um, you know, there's a reason why that has so much uh, credibility. Um, so, yeah, that would definitely be on there. Um, Early Emperor, you know, the, the EP. Um, yeah, the EP to, to the uh, first album, I think, is, is really a defining part of the black metal canon. Um, First, uh, second Venom album, you know, mm. Black Metal. Mm. I think that that just every year, I think that sounds better than it did. And also the first Blasphemy album again, you know, those two records kind of on the surface seem quite simple and not not much to them, but they, they just have something at the core of them, which is so um, archetypal and kind of iconic, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Thorns demos, again, that's almost like you can hear the birth of uh, literally the the birth of the Scandinavian black metal sound on just these uh, instrumental tapes. And so ahead of their time, so far yeah. ahead of their time. Yeah, totally, um, totally seminal, really. Um, 
And I also like the stuff by the Black Legions, the French mm. uh, bands like Vlad Tepes and Belketra. I think that stuff, again, is very... It wasn't original necessarily when it came out because it was, you know, there was a lot of inspiration from Bathory and the Norwegian bands, but it's it's a high point of that sort of music. Um, Street, you know, uh, it's a, yeah, I, I I struggle to I struggled to kind of um, even putting together a top ten or a top twenty. I really. And what what was the most authentic? What was the most hair raisingly, terrifyingly powerful live expression of black metal you ever saw? Um. I mean, the first band I saw as a as a school kid was Emperor, so obviously that made a huge impression on mm. me. Um, actually, it wasn't one of their best shows because the sound was terrible. But but you know, that's a band that's obviously kept coming back to play shows. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, seeing Emperor now is like such a different ex- yeah. yeah a different experience. It means, in fact, I remember seeing them with you in two thousand and six. Yeah, that I I found that quite an an. And emotional and, and I thought that was like being in oh hang on a second are we talking about Norway or, or London no in London oh that was crap yeah no that was I, I didn't like that <laughs> no I, I, it's, I found that for me I guess Emperor in 99 was you know that was like a good balance between yes yes being very proficient and professional and having good sound which they didn't have in previous times but also still having some of that spirit which they had, you know, obviously, which they don't have now. Well, because I, I was going to say, I found it entirely lacking when we were at the, was it the Astoria, wasn't it? The Astoria, yeah. The yeah, the yeah, yeah. I, I just thought that was, the, it was the slick, polished metal uh, product at that point. I, I felt this, I mean, I know that's not how they intended, but it's just, that's where, that's just life. That's where it got to. Um, yeah. But no, I, I'd seen them a couple of years previously at Inferno, um, which I just thought was magical. Um, it It was... It was mad. I mean, I'm sure you must have been there as well, but it, it was absolutely, it was like being in Valhalla or something. It was, you couldn't put words to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm struggling here, actually. <laughs> but the smaller shows maybe made more of an impression. Uh, you know, seeing, yeah, a lot of the 90s gigs, seeing Marduk or seeing, yeah. uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, look, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll leave you to think. I'll leave you to think on that one. But um, just just before we go, um, I do have to ask about the Metal Hammer situation. I mean, you must be. I mean, how do you feel? Um, well, it's a great loss. You know, it's actually ten. It was ten years last year that I started writing for them. So mm-hmm. I did a uh, just over a decade, and um, it was uh, you know from a, from a selfish point of view, it was a constant in my life. Um, but also, you know, that was a magazine that we started, that was, I guess, the first metal magazine we started reading. Mm. Um, and it was, it was, I guess it's the biggest, it, I, I'm not sure what the sales are versus Decibel, but certainly it's either the biggest or was the biggest um, metal mag or, this, or the joint biggest or the second one of the two. So, you know, it had such a huge presence that I think the loss of it is, is going to be felt um you know, because that was a that was a magazine that would cover uh, whatever the kids are into now, but would also cover underground black metal or you know, you there's not many magazines that you can buy that has um, you know Iron Maiden on the cover and then Archgoat at the back. You know, mm-hmm. I think and, that was really and it really was, it it did have a, a good stewardship, didn't it? I mean, it really was in, in good in in good hands editorially. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely uh, there's lots of ways that a magazine like Metal Hammer could have gone and I think w- a lot of it because of Alex Milas uh, but also other people made sure that they kept it very true to um, a, a, a genuine metal foundation so although it would cover you know stuff from the new metal scene and you know rubbish like that you, you the core of it was uh stuff that is part of metal culture i iron maiden metallica um you know a monomath i think is a good example a monomath isn't to everyone's taste but but it's monomath, acceptably still proper it's still you know what i mean yeah it's still part of metal culture you know if you you can see in the 90s and that's happened to a lot of magazines that you would have 
um, you know, bands like Cold Chamber and these sort of joke bands, uh, you know, which would which had no roots in a metal culture. If somebody gets into Limp Bizkit or, um, you know, not to hate on these bands, although they are crap, but, you know, a lot of them, they're just, if, even if they're your thing, they're not really part of the metal scene. They're, 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 they're heavy music that you could call metal or you could just call heavy rock or heavy, you know, whatever. Yeah. But they don't, they're not a gateway for people. Whereas I think what was really important with Metal Hammer is, you know, somebody would buy that with Metallica on the, you know, let's say a 15 year old kid buys that. It's got Metallica on the cover. Then it's got a Monomath who are in the main section of the magazine. So they're like, okay, this is like a big metal band, but they're a bit heavier than what I'm used to, or, you know. And then at the back of the magazine, you have an interview with, uh, yeah, Mysticum or, you know, Dark Throne or whatever. And it, it, that, that, you actually need some sort of gateway like that because it, although the internet has provided, you know, a very easy access for people to discover things, because the people are just overwhelmed by choice, having a magazine which sort of curates, uh, it's really important. And, you know, there's a trickle-down effect that, you know, those, those kids who, you know, buy the magazine age 13 or 14 for Metallica or I'm on a mask, will be the some of those will be the guys in black metal bands in 2020 you know there is that trickle down effect so well think, we're we're sitting here talking you know yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly so, so there will be I, but but having said all that i can't believe that metal hammer classic rock and prog will be gone for long yeah uh, so what's what's happen. the situation there because people will want to know i mean there's going to be a management buyout or people coming together have you got any insight uh not a great deal it's all it's fairly hush hush but but essentially you know team rock bought um bought metal hammer classic rock and prog yeah um and those magazines always made a profit and did well but team rock didn't um they invested millions into things like radio and you know other they wanted to be a global rock metal brand that didn't pan out and they you know they basically bombed and took those magazines with them mm. so some i think at, at the moment the situation is that somebody could buy those magazines um but they'd probably have as far as i understand it which is fairly limited they'd have to pay all the outstanding oh dear oh dear okay debts, you know i yeah. think they because obviously not you know we haven't been paid for you know for the, the the last few months you know the last invoices haven't been paid yeah so as far as i understand it, if they bought it direct they'd have to pay those mm -hmm. but if, it, if it's sold off as a second yeah i'm sure my ignorance here but i think if no, it's sold off, sold yeah. further down the line yeah. they don't have to pay any of the debt sure. so i suspect sure. those brands i think will return but i really hope that the people you know i hope it happens soon enough that those people who are you know staff the magazines that haven't moved on to other things because you could foreseeably buy up. And you know, the worst thing that could happen is that one of these kind of, uh, I'm trying to think what is a non-offensive way of saying it, but you know, one of these uh, heavy music mainstream yeah. type characters buys the name Metal Hammer and then just starts putting out purely yeah, garbage. Commercial, yeah. commercial heavy rubbish. Um, so that that's that would be worse than it coming back in some ways. What I hope is that it will come back, or the three magazines will come back fairly soon and have important people. Uh, you know, Jerry Ewing, who's the um, well was is the editor of Prog. Mm. Uh, if Prog comes back, it ought to have him involved. Mm. And you know, mm -hmm. Jonathan Seltzer, obviously, of course, of course, Hammer. our good friend. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, you know, if they're writing about black metal, they might want to get me to write a few articles there i say you know I don't think you have to have some sort of uh, you have you have to have the team you have to have the the, the true team uh, you i know. think so i think so i mean there might be someone who is better at writing about black metal that they use instead but if you change too many of the components it won't be the same magazine and yeah. you know you can see that that's a brand that's all over the world you have greek metal hammer, yeah german metal hammer metal yeah hammer, huge yeah. yeah so I just hope it's not, you know, the UK has a bit of a tendency of um, coming down on the wrong side of the coin when it comes to heavy music. Yes. I really hope we don't end up with sort of uh, a smash hits of, um, you know, mm. and, uh, 
Bling 182 and all that stuff I under do. the Metal Hammer brand because people know that brand will sell. So it's, it's conceivable it might happen, but let's hope it doesn't. Let's hope. There's a good note to end on, Dal. Um, just a, a pleasure as always. Great. I, I know everybody's really going to enjoy this. Just um, let us know where to pick up uh, the books. Uh, the best place to go is cultneverdies.com or cultneverdies.shopify.com and uh, you, we also have um, exclusive uh, shirts and hoods by bands like Oliver and Beherit and a lot of the bands that have been involved in the project have also um, done their merchandise with us which is cool so that, that's worth checking out. Yeah I really, I, it's really good to see those old like uh, I think it was the uh, Bergtat or Kveltanger shirts I yeah. uh, really love seeing that stuff too okay listen Dial thank you um, everyone will really enjoy this and uh, cultneverdies.com uh, everyone get to it so that was Dial Patterson everyone and you can just hear the dedication with which he's pursued this craft or I suppose this journey of his um, you can order his books uh, in, in a new sort of bulk order you can get that and loads of cool t-shirts as he was just explaining out the cult never dies or I should say cultneverdies.com as ever I hope you've enjoyed this episode uh, and I hope you enjoy what we do on this podcast we really do strive uh, to bring you some really really good quality listening so keep using metalireland.com and if you like this the best thing you can do is of course to subscribe to the podcast but the other best thing you can do is uh, and this is crucial to leave me a review on iTunes it really really helps so till next time the past is alive I'm Earl Grey over and out